is a member at the Council on Foreign Relations and a professor at Northeastern University, and he joins us uh, this morning. Professor, thanks for being with us. Why was Iran invited by UN Secretary General Moon in the first place? That's a very good question. I think it was uh, quite silly of him to do. Um, in order for Geneva II to be successful, Assad needs to be weakened because right now he's in a position of strength and so concessions won't be forthcoming. By inviting Iran, it basically says to Assad, you know, that there's going to be no pressure on him and that he doesn't need to make any accommodations whatsoever. Uh, furthermore, the opposition, the uh, Syrian National Coalition, um, which is opposed to Assad, um, was also opposed to Iran. And the coalition said that were Iran to attend um, this uh, the Geneva II, this convention, um, that this delegation uh, would withdraw. And so by inviting Iran at the last minute, uh, the UN um, really uh, harmed the prospects uh, for the conference to prove fruitful. Okay, the talks are back on now, uh, but there are a lot of questions about how effective anything that comes out of this conference will be. The different groups of rebels, for example, that are actually fighting the Assad regime don't necessarily recognize the opposition coalition. So even if, best case scenario, some sort of ceasefire can be brokered, will it really mean an end to the fighting, an end to this war? It really won't. Um, I think the prospects for success um, are very, very small. You're quite right. There are all these rebel groups on the ground in Syria, and they do not feel represented um, by the coalition. And in fact, uh, the rebels have said that uh, it does not want the peace process to go forward at all. It does not feel represented by the coalition, and nothing that is established in Geneva will in any way be binding on the ground. Meanwhile, the biggest bloc, Professor, in the opposition coalition, the Syrian National Council, which, as you know, is made up of Syrians in exile, it's backed by the West, has actually pulled out of the opposition bloc. So how significant is that? Well, in, going back a few days ago, I mean, it's actually surprising that the, that the Syrian National Coalition is there at all. Um, I believe there are 120 members, 58 of them uh, were in support of attending this conference. There needed to be a number of people, uh, a number of delegates uh, to abstain for the coalition to uh, move forward. Um, and so, yeah, now at the last minute, uh, even after Iran, the invitation to Iran was rescinded, now this large component of the coalition, the council, um, is not going to be uh, attending. And so you can see that, um, that the opposition to Assad is very much fragmented. And this very much hurts the opposition, both uh, in Istanbul, uh, where the coalition is based, as well as on the ground in terms of the rebel groups, right. which also don't seem to be able to coordinate with one another. By contrast, the Assad regime um, is relatively cohesive, and this gives it a huge edge um, in terms of smashing the opposition. Right. It also means that going into talks, uh, there isn't a lot of incentive for Assad to give any concessions. I want to bring this issue up. It wasn't that long ago, less than six months ago, that the U.S. was talking about military action in Syria. If these talks fail to achieve anything, does that option, uh, is it back on the table, do you think? No, I don't think it's on the table. I think that that moment has come and gone. Um, the, initially, the United States was considering getting involved because there was this notion that the Free Syrian Army, the FSA, that the U.S. could work with them, that the FSA was gaining ground against Assad, that we could support them and ultimately beat back the regime. But times have changed since Geneva won and since that kind of you know, talk was on the table. Now Assad is much, much stronger. Um, he's regained uh, a lot of territory. Um, he's being strongly supported by Russia, as well as Shiite militia groups coming in from Iraq, never mind Hezbollah. Um, and in comparison, the rebel groups are, are in complete disarray 
and they're increasingly eclipsed by Islamist groups. And the Islamist Front, which is an umbrella group for these Islamist groups, um, is adamantly opposed to working with Assad, adamantly opposed to the Syrian National Coalition. And so there's all sorts of chaos in Syria right now. The Assad regime is relatively stronger, and I don't think that the U.S. wants to get involved militarily at all. And the chaos is spreading throughout the region. This is now the largest humanitarian disaster on the planet. Max Abrams, professor at Northeastern University, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Neighbor